Hi there, folks. Uh, Premier Kenny here with Minister Travis Tays, and we are joining you together with some other ministers to talk about uh, Minister Ta Travis's budget that he just tabled this afternoon, a plan for protecting lives and livelihoods focused on health care and jobs. We're also joined, uh, just for social distancing reasons, in another room uh, here in the ledge by uh, Health Minister Tyler Shandro, Minister of Children's Services Rebecca Schultz, who had a big announcement yesterday about supporting parents uh, and dealing with um, uh, child care related costs through COVID, and Minister Schweitzer, who's coordinating Alberta's recovery plan. That's our bold plan to build, uh, diversify, and create tens of thousands of new jobs. So as I said, the, the focal point of this budget, uh, first of all, interesting point, this is the first budget ever held under uh, legislation that we promised in the last election to create a fixed budget date. Because in the past, governments have kind of manipulated when they held the budget based on short-term political interests, which created a lot of unpredictability. Um, and we thought it was really important we have the discipline of regular budgeting. That's why we did this before the end of February. And um, obviously, uh, we are. this is a budget that is, uh, has been taken way off course from last year because of the triple whammy of the gl biggest global health crisis in a century, the biggest gl worldwide economic contraction since the Great Depression, and the largest ever collapse in energy prices. Now, thankfully, energy prices have recently begun to recover, but we can't uh, count on that as a uh, to, to plan on on dealing with our fiscal challenges just by wishing our way out of it. Too many governments have done that in the past. So really what this budget is about is uh, targeted necessary investments in health care uh, with, uh, I think it's $1.5 billion in contingency uh, for COVID-related uh, care. And then another uh, $900 million, I believe, for surgical, to, to, so we can meet our target to reduce the wait times for surgeries. Uh, so that's... Uh, Two and a half, essentially two and a half billion dollars additional. We have record health sp uh, funding here, um, as well as about a billion and a half dollars uh, in investments for job creation and to uh, speed up the diversification of our economy. Things like job training and other uh, issues that we can get into. Travis, do you want to uh, just emph emph highlight anything apart from that? Sure. No, I, I think you've nailed it, Premier. This uh, <clears throat> this budget is really about resourcing health to deal with the pandemic. Uh, from day one, we've ensured that uh, health was not spared resources. Uh, we know that uh, getting past the pandemic is critical to our economic recovery, and economic recovery is critical to our long-term fiscal recovery. And so there's a sequencing here, and Budget 2021 lays out those priorities. Awesome. So we're going to start going to your questions, folks. Um, you, know the, you know the drill. Uh, please just put them in the comment section below. Uh, please remember, we have Travis and I here, but we've also got Minister of Health Shandro, Minister of Jobs, Economy and Innovation, Doug Schweitzer, Minister of Children's Services, Rebecca Schultz. Uh, so please ask uh, any of us questions. We, uh, As much as possible, we'd like to talk about the budget tonight. If you've got COVID-related questions, we'll try to take a couple, but we'll be doing a more uh, COVID-themed uh, Facebook Lives in the days to come. All right, so first question goes to uh, Laurie Jean, says... When will the UCP government realize how important education is? Well, I would say, Laurie, that we do realize how important education is, which is why even in a, a fiscal crisis where we're running now a, an $18 billion deficit, uh, we have maintained education funding, which was our commitment to Albertans to maintain or increase funding. In fact, I think there's a slight increase in the range of about two or $300 million. Uh, and uh, now on the post-secondary side, uh, we are asking our universities and colleges to uh, uh, reduce some of their administrative overhead and operate more efficiently because the Dr. Janice McKinnon's report on Alberta's finances in 2019, you may remember she's a former NDP finance minister, and she and her nonpartisan expert panel identified uh, Alberta's spending on post-secondary education as being the biggest outlier in terms of our spending. We spend more than any other provincial government by a country mile right across the board, but the biggest area where we spend more on a per student or per capita basis is on post-secondary. In fact, um, just to give you one example, uh, the University of Alberta uh, has been receiving more funding from uh, the government of Alberta than the University of Toronto does from uh, the government of Ontario, even though U of T has twice as many students. So we sp we've been spending about 25% more per, per student uh, in our colleges and universities and with lower completion rates. So 
Um, we're challenging the university administrators to learn from uh, high quality public universities in the rest of Canada about how to operate more efficiently because otherwise, uh, Laurie, we're going to have to raise your taxes to pay for that and that would kill jobs at, a t at, a, at the worst possible time. All right, next question goes to, uh, who have we got here? Um, Brendan O'Connell, it's a good Irish name. Job training for what jobs? More nurses, more government bureaucrats, more government. No, Brendan, in fact, to the contrary, we are carefully reducing the overall size of government here. I mean, there is an increase in spending right now to deal with COVID, obviously, um, to buy more, we, you know, we had to go out and buy more ventilators and masks and personal protective equipment. We had to set up emergency potential overflow hospitals. We have had to pay massive overtime. We provided wage top-ups for healthcare aides and long-term care centers so that the seniors who are most vulnerable would have the care they need and we could pr help to prevent uh, outbreaks and, and care for people when they happened. Um, we, we've had to onboard people to do contact tracing and, uh, and so much more. So I'm sure anybody can understand that we've had a surge in spending also on the economic side because of the, the, the largest contraction in the world economy and in energy prices in a century, we've had to make some targeted investment in areas um, like building, building Alberta, construction, infrastructure that have created good construction jobs across the province. So when you talk about job training, we're not actually on the government side, we are shrinking shrinking uh, in a careful and prudent way the overall size of the government public sector. You know the NDP that went before us massively expanded that. We are contracting that. We're getting attacked for it every day by the big government unions. And uh, Minister Tays underscored in the budget today that we will be asking the big government unions uh, to, to, to uh, show some sacrifice. We, if we're all in this together, it's got to include the people who work in government who have pretty much guaranteed jobs. And uh, so we, in the collective bargaining with the big government unions this year, we are asking them uh, to, uh, to take some, some modest reductions. Uh, but what we're talking about in terms of job training there, Brendan, is, is uh, uh, for the, there's 300,000 unemployed Albertans. A lot of them have been, been unemployed for months or even longer. A lot of them, as you know, blue, good blue collar folks from the oil field services sector, uh, and a lot of white collar folks in downtown Calgary who lost their jobs with consolidations and layoffs. Uh, smart, highly trained and educated people of all kinds and all ages across our province. But right now they, they're, they're not trained for the jobs that are becoming available. So we want, we want to empower employers to identify where they need folks, what kind of skills they need. And we'll, we, at Minister Copping will be announcing an exciting new program, the largest ever job training program in Alberta history. So just stay tuned for that. All right, next question goes to Jet Schmidt who says, if you open up the economy so people can pay taxes and not rely on the government, wouldn't that help your budget? Thanks, Jet. Uh, I think you're probably talking about uh, COVID restrictions. So our economy is uh, open, just to be clear. Uh, over 99% of businesses in Alberta are able to operate within public health measures. Uh, now that I know it's still very painful for the uh, less than 1% who are closed or mainly impaired by public health measures designed to, let's remember why those measures are in place, they're designed to um, uh, avoid preventable deaths from COVID-19 by controlling the spread and also to protect the healthcare system. Uh, but uh, with those, it, it's over 99% of Alberta's economy or gross domestic product, which is unaff substantially unaffected by COVID restrictions. And we are opening JET. I'd remind you that on um, March 6, we opened up the schools for in-classroom learning, bringing 720,000 Alberta uh, teachers, uh, staff, and students into classrooms every day for five days to help their life chances and the kids' mental health they're learning. Uh, we uh, reopened personal services in January uh, on step one of our, um, of our path forward for reopening which is pegged to hospitalizations. We went to uh, in-person dining and a number of other activities, and uh, we may be taking the next step, uh, the next step forward next week. So I, get, I do get your point that COVID restrictions can be harmful, but you, uh, Travis, would you like to comment on how the, the overall damage here has been external and not self-imposed? Sure, and, and, and that's a good point, Premier. The, the reality is that 
um, so much of the economic challenge that we're experiencing right now in the province of Alberta is because of the, the large contraction in, in the global economy. It's because of the great energy uh, price collapse that we experienced earlier this year. And of course, we're feeling it in the province. We are a resource rich province, a province that depends on resource industries and export markets. And so uh, our, our, our economy has been damaged uh, because of those external forces. Fortunately, we're seeing some positives. So of course, energy prices are rising much quicker right now, I think, than, than most analysts and economists would have predicted. And that's positive, but it's gonna take some time uh, for increased in investment uh, to land in the province and with that job creation. Martin Backhouse is a good question here. What is budgeted for older people to get training? Most programs I see are for young college people. So, uh, Martin, part of the $1.5 billion that we're setting aside for uh, the economy, for economic investments that will stimulate job creation in this budget, uh, of that $1.5 billion, um, two or $300 million is, is tagged for additional uh, job creation. Uh, we are creating a, a program we'll be launching, hopefully in the near future, called Jobs Now. And it will uh, basically, it, this is not about government knows best, but recognizing that employers know where the jobs are, where the job demands are. We will invite employers to put together training proposals to us. And if they put some skin in the game and invest in it, we'll uh, top, top it up uh, with, some, uh, with an offsetting public investment. Uh, and we will make it very clear that we want this to include what the economists call uh, groups that are underrepresented in the labor force. And that tends to include seniors who do want to work, that too often are overlooked uh, in, in, uh, in hiring, as well as young people who have uh, the 18 to 25 year olds, for example, have always had a stubbornly high unemployment rate. Um, uh, newer Canadians, people with disabilities, if they get uh, in, in employers who are willing to invest a little bit in, in training, supervision, support, things like transportation, um, Indigenous Albertans. So there are those different groups that, that are over, have higher than average unemployment rates, and they do get a special emphasis in, uh, in these job training programs that we'll be expanding, uh, hopefully uh, in March. All right, James Carpenter, I hope, is that the James I know from Didsbury? How do you envision agriculture as part of the rebuild of Alberta? So uh, why don't I kick that over to Doug, because uh, agriculture is a major uh, <coughs> sector strategy within Alberta's economic recovery plan. Uh, thanks, Premier. And you know what? I think you don't have to go much further than Olds College, uh, which is close there to Didsbury, to take a look at the advances that we have in technology, the applications, and just potential in the Olds College. They have a whole research farm where they literally have massive tractor drones that they put out there in the fields and just look at different opportunities for how they can grow the technology space and the different applications that come into ag. And that's just kind of the future agricultural technology applications. Uh, on top of that, the last year we had a record year for crops in, our, in Alberta in 2020. But we want to build on that success. So we've made a historic investment of over $800 million in southern Alberta to open up 200,000 acres to irrigation project. That was a partnership with the local irrigation district the Canada Infrastructure Bank and the government of Alberta to get that done. It's going to create thousands of jobs. It's going to increase our GDP by hundreds of millions of dollars, create higher value products as well that we can turn into manufactured products that can be shipped all over the world. So we think that there's a potential to expand on that. We're looking for further projects as well to partner with irrigation districts around Alberta to expand out the higher value products we have. And when you take a look at the ability we have in Alberta, like we've had it so good in the oil and gas industry for so long, we have to just scratch that surface on a whole bunch of different areas where we can just do so much better, perform so much better. Uh, ag was with what brought my grandparents up to the peace country, to Homestead after World War I. And you know what? I just think that this is a huge opportunity for us to grow the ag sector. Minister Dreeshen our ag minister. He's been working in collaboration with us for how do we grow the sector out? How do we take advantage of the technology and how do we feed Albertans? How do we feed the world in, in our province? Huge growth potential here as well. Uh, I know Minister Taves is a big ag guy as well. He may want to add a few words yeah. on this uh, so, on, from his perspective. Th thanks, Doug. Uh, Travis, uh, in his regular uh, day job is a rancher and was president of the Canadian Cattlemen's Association, so he probably has something to add to this. Well, not a lot. Uh, Minister Schweitzer did a great job uh, of talking about the potential of agriculture for sure in this province. It, it has um, an incredible future. 
And in fact, agriculture has been one of the real bright spots in the economy this last year when our economy was so challenged. And Minister Schweitzer talked about uh, the big crop that we had across most of the province. Some areas in the north were challenged with tough weather, but largely we had an excellent crop and incredible global prices right now for Alberta agriculture commodities. So that's very positive, very hopeful. The livestock sector um, is, is doing well. We've had solid pricing. They're a little concerned about these high feed grain prices, but I know uh, they're innovative folks and they're going to find a way to manage through this. But, but here's a really exciting opportunity for Alberta agriculture. It's a little known fact that food manufacturing and processing until very recently was our largest manufacturing sector in the province of Alberta. It's just very recently fallen behind petrochemical manufacturing, but there's great potential in ag manufacturing. And so I know Minister Dreeshin is working on a sector strategy. He has plans to attract significant additional egg processing investment in the province. And that will bode well, not only for the manufacturing sector, but for broadly uh, agriculture throughout. I know a lot of our hunter egg colonies are already leading the way on that. They, they They're do, diversifying they do. themselves into manufacturing, like manufacturing. Uh, okay, we've got Lisa Clanton who says, how about letting private clinics operate on Albertans? Right now, Albertans have to travel to Toronto for surgeries when they're not supposed to travel. Keep the money in Alberta instead. That is a great question, uh, Lisa, and I'm going to uh, ask uh, Tyler Shander to answer. Well, thanks, uh, Premier. Thanks, Lisa, for that question. First of all, I'll, I'll say this, is that when we're talking about surgical facilities that are independently owned, independently operated, um, I don't call them a private clinic because still the, the care that's provided in those clinics is 100% publicly funded. So uh, they are an independent clinic. We're now calling them chartered surgical facilities, and we have 43 of them in the province. Um, and we're going to continue to give them more volume of surgeries. And in 2021, we will also be going to having a, an RFP so that we can um, have more opportunities for other uh, chartered surgical facilities in the province. And uh, so it's a great initiative, but just remember, they're not, they're not, I don't call them private clinics, same way that I don't call my family doctor's uh, office and her clinic a, uh, a private clinic, even though she's, it's privately owned by her and privately uh, operated, but at the end of the day, I'd leave without paying. It's, uh, it's paid by the taxpayer at the end of the day. So, uh, but thank you very much, Lisa. It's a good point. And in 2021, we will be expanding how many of the, uh, the chartered surgical facilities we have in the province. Tyler, you forgot to mention that you're getting 900 million extra dollars in Travis's budget to do that with here. Uh, you know, uh, Not you, even you, a thank you, you, you got to take a victory lap or say thanks at least. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no, and 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 we are and we have throughout COVID as well tried to expand the amount of surgeries that we can provide in an AHS facility, but also how many we can do in these chartered surgical facilities. Trying to be as innovative as we can to be able to make sure we're doing as as close to as many surgeries as we did in the previous fiscal year as we are doing in this one. And so, and part of it is with this 900 million that we're being provided by Treasury Board to be able to make sure we're on track to reducing surgical wait times for, for all Albertans and our commitment to getting surgical wait times down to, for most surgeries, down to four months. And that that's the commitment we made in the election called the um, surgical wait time guarantee, surgery wait time guarantee, and it's based partly on a really successful program in Saskatchewan where they did, and that was the birthplace place of Medicare, Tommy Douglas and all that, and they uh, did more contracting out of publicly funded surgeries to privately operated uh, surgical clinics. You're going to hear a lot of counter caterwauling from the special interest that this is the end of Medicare and all that. No, it's actually providing more surgeries more quickly uh, at uh, public expense. The reason they don't like it is because the unions don't control it. The big government unions don't control it. But our view is the patient and not the unions or any interest group should be at the center of our healthcare system. All right, the next question goes to Paul Bettio, who says, I missed today's budget. Will there be a big effect on post-secondary institutions? Uh, Travis? Uh, that's a great question, Paul. Uh, no, there won't be a big effect on post-secondary institutions. Uh, compared to budget 2020, we've actually increased our uh, expected overall spend of post-secondary institutions uh, for the upcoming years. In fact, it was increased by about $250 million. That doesn't mean that uh, provincial taxpayers will be supporting those institutions at a higher rate. But what that does is it, uh, we've been encouraging post-secondary institutions to be entrepreneurial, to go out and, and find opportunities to increase their revenues as they also explore opportunities to deliver more programs. And right now it's essential that they deliver 
key programs to retrain Albertans and to ensure Albertans have skills for the new economy. So no, um, the budget uh, 2021 is not going to uh, limit post-secondary in institutions. What it does, it frees up those institutions to uh, find additional revenues wherever they can find it. And believe me, we have entrepreneurial folks in, in those institutions, and then they can roll out appropriate programming to ensure that Albertans have skills for the economy. All right, next question is going to Minister of Children's Services, Rebecca Schultz. It's from Alexa Briggs, who says, given that women have taken the brunt of this pandemic and that the calls for affordable and accessible childcare as a means to support women in recovery are well documented, why didn't the budget make an, any investment in childcare, but instead seize a small cut? Go ahead, Minister. Well, thank you so much, Alexa, for that great question. Uh, I would say this, we do know that women have been disproportionately impacted uh, throughout the pandemic and largely um, it's from industries that have had to remain closed uh, during the pandemic. And that's why our government has been so focused on protecting the health and safety of those most vulnerable, but also keeping our economy as open as possible. However, when it comes to the childcare budget, we have not made any reductions. In fact, we are maintaining supports to make sure that working parents have uh, subsidies. We have the highest child care subsidies in the entire country. Uh, parents can access child care, uh, low and middle income families for as low as $13 a day. And we're continuing to create spaces uh, in what we call child care deserts. So areas where there are not enough spaces for the young growing populations in certain areas across the province. So we are absolutely maintaining those important investments and continuing to work with um, our partners, not only in the federal government, but in municipalities, as well as operators uh, to target additional investments where they're needed. Thanks for that great question. Yes, thanks, Rebecca. So next question goes to Rock Sal or Sale. Will Alberta seriously look at building our own refineries? Um, so I'll, I'll just start with that, maybe kick it over to Doug. Uh, actually, Alberta did build a refinery with a lot of tax dollars uh, called the Northwest Upgrader. It, and it was a long and very expensive process. Uh, is it for, are they formally commissioned yet, Travis? They, they are. Uh, they're operating at this point. But okay. Premier, we took a $2.5 uh, billion write-down right. in, in our previous fiscal year. Uh, now, this is something that was planned about a decade ago. It was five years, almost five years over schedule and about two and a half X over budget, by, if, I rec if I recall yeah, correctly. Right. Um, and so... <laughs> This was about a $10 billion expenditure to process like 75,000 barrels of diesel a day. And to put that in, co in comparison, in India, I visited a, the world's largest refinery of, owned by Reliance at, uh, in Gujarat, and they process a, a million barrels a day, a million barrels a day, um, and they built that for about uh, $3 billion. So the economy, it, the, the economics are really tough. For, for building a refinery up here, uh, we don't have a year, you know, it's, it's, we don't have the same kind of year-round construction season. Uh, uh, labor costs are much higher. Uh, and there's a reason why refineries tend to be on coast coastlines around the world. But here's the bottom line. If, if any private sector company came up and said they were willing to, to risk 10 to $20 billion of their shareholders' money to build a refinery, we would roll out the red carpet. We would give them concierge service. We would sit down and do everything we could uh, to make that happen. Uh, we would love to see that happen, but it, it, particularly given our experience on the Northwest Upgrader, would not be responsible for Alberta to suddenly pretend it's a uh, oil refining company and take a 10 to $20 billion risk for taxpayers for something that the market is not demanding. I don't know, Doug, do you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, thanks, Premier. You know what? When I get questions like this in town halls, it, it's usually a similar theme to lots of diversification efforts that come that build off of our natural gas strategy and our yeah. petrochemical strategy that goes along with it. There's huge opportunities, uh, given the infrastructure that we have in our province, to be world leaders in hydrogen, to be world leaders in petrochemicals, the circular economy that we want to do with recycling, LNG opportunities. It builds on our natural expertise that we have with the intellectual horsepower of Albertans. Like we have one of the most inventive uh, teams of people at our companies that are unlocking new technologies on an annual basis here in Alberta that are you know, taken around the world. So with these new emerging technologies that are coming, particularly in the hydrogen, hydrogen space, huge amount of interest in that. Same thing goes with carbon capture and storage technologies. These are big projects. And Alberta led the way getting that technology built. 
big opportunities for us in Alberta on that front as well. And we're seeing an immense amount of interest uh, in our province for projects in, those, in that space as well. Thanks, Doug. Uh, and I just wanted to come back to uh, the previous question about uh, child care. There was a question about why the budget is cutting money for child care. And um, I've got the budget right here that was just hot off the press, just released about five hours ago, page 106. And, you, and by the way, this is available online. You can look it up yourself. Uh, yourselves. There's on um, page 106 is a summary of the spending in children's uh, services, which is Rebecca's department. And I'll just walk you through the numbers here. Um, in uh, 2019, Alberta was spending 1.54 uh, billion on, on uh, in that department, which is mainly childcare support, and then uh, 1.6 billion. Now it's 1.7 billion, then 1.7 and 1.7. So there, as Minister Schultz said, there there is no cut there, uh, and in fact. Um, um, Last year, we budgeted 390 million for childcare within that overall budget, and this year, that's this year upcoming, it's going up to uh, 386 and 418 million. So it's stable or slightly increasing. All right, next question goes uh, to Trevor Yakachuk, who says, "Jason Kenny, will you take, will you and your MLAs lead by example and take a pay cut? Pay cut? Sorry. Yes, Trevor, absolutely. Uh, already done that, and uh, promise made, promise kept." In uh, this uh, August of 2019, we kept our commitment to Albertans to cut our own pay to lead by example. Uh, I, cut, I took a 10% cut in my salary, and all of the MLAs and ministers took a 5% cut. That was on top of an earlier 5% cut under the previous PC government. So uh, premier salary is down 15%, MLAs and ministers is down 10%. Um, also, in the intervening five, six years, there's been a pay freeze. So um, we're trying to lead by example. Also, the, the political staff, those are the folks that work with us in the legislature. Uh, there's not a lot of them. There's maybe 120 or 150 of those folks, but they do important work. And they just recently took a 7% pay cut as well. So, um, and I should mention, usually when I say that, people th then say, oh yeah, but you MLAs have got a rich pension program. Actually, Ralph Klein killed the MLA pension program way back in 1993, 28 years ago. All right, Je Jenny Ellen says, what about class sizes? This is uh, hurting our children. Uh, well, uh, first of all, Jenny, I would point out that um, the, uh, there, we actually did a review of exactly that question because the province had spent over the last decade um, billions of dollars. I forget exactly the amount, but it was... It was I think it would be three or four billion dollars on dedicated efforts to reduce class sizes. And so we did an analysis of how effective that was uh, with a, a third party expert. And they came back and said that class sizes had actually increased slightly after billions of extra dollars supposedly dedicated to reducing class sizes. So that always seems to happen when governments spend more on education. What's really going on there? Well, what's really going on is that in 80% um, of the expenditures in our education system are uh, labor costs, uh, salaries and, and uh, benefits for teachers and other staff. And uh, in their collective bargaining agreements, they, are, they get increases based on uh, their uh, time of service, their, their number of years worked. And so you end up paying more for the same number of, of teachers over time. And, and so that's basically where the money went. Uh, it went to pay for labor, not hire new teachers, but pay for the, uh, stat, the increases that are wired into the collective bargaining agreements. I don't know, Rebecca, if you'd like to add anything to that? Sure, I absolutely can. And Alberta does continue to have one of the best funded education systems in Canada. Uh, and the new funding model actually has lots of flexibilities for boards. School boards make these decisions about staffing. Uh, and we do expect that they put as much effort as possible into making sure those funds go directly to putting teachers in classrooms with students and, of course, support staff as well. Um, also, at the end of last year, I believe school divisions had $834 million in reserves. They have flexibility in how to use that. And again, we do expect that they put these dollars directly in the classroom, but local um, elected boards across Alberta, they make those decisions and, and we would encourage them um, to focus on students and teachers in the classroom. Okay, now uh, next question goes to uh, 
Fred Penner. He says 280 hospitalizations as of today, obviously referring to COVID hospitalizations. Your criteria to go to step two, and he's, I think Fred's talking about our uh, path forward for relaxing uh, public health measures. He says your criteria to, to step two is 450 in hospital. What's the issue in making a decision to open up? For your information, step three hospitalizations criteria is 300 in hospital, uh, we, and we are lower than that. Thank you, Fred. It's a good question. Uh, well, I, actually, I'll just refer this to Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Premier, and great question, Fred. Thanks for the question. Now, in our uh, very balanced and responsible path forward plan, we provided Albertans with a few things. One was uh, for us to provide an opportunity to let Albertans know when measures were going to be eased. We were also giving people um, an understanding of, um, well, a as we went through each of these steps, having an opportunity to review how the easing of those measures might affect our, our numbers and then our hospitalizations. And so knowing that it takes several weeks for, for someone to be able to become sick with COVID and then for them to become sick with COVID to end up being in a hospital, uh, we wanted to be ha able to have three weeks in between each of these steps. And so that's why we have three weeks to be able to, to look at the data, measure the data, make sure that we can then move carefully and responsibly into the, each of these next steps. And so um, that the, uh, the first step started um, February 8th. And so that means then we're going to, to March 1st, reviewing that data. And then as you pointed out, our hospitalizations um, are uh, the, uh, the key metric in being able to ease um, and going through each of these steps. We want to be able to make sure that people understood that the reason for these measures in the first place is the trying to reduce the, the stress on our hospital system. And so it looks like in, in the next few days, um, barring any unforeseen consequences, and I don't see that happening uh, anytime soon, uh, that we probably will be going into step two at that time. Uh, or, or soon after March uh, 1st, uh, depending on, on what the Cabinet COVID Committee uh, decides. Um, but that's the reason that we are having the three weeks in between each of these steps, Fred. Thank you. All right, I'd just like to refer back to my earlier answer on class sizes. Um, I did look up the uh, 2019 class size initiative review, and I'd ask my uh, team here to post that on the comment section. And uh, it turns out I, I, I took a bit of a stab from memory about how much, and I was bang on. I said it was three or four billion that we had spent on uh, class uh, on initiatives to reduce uh, class sizes without any reduction in class sizes. And indeed, the executive summary of the 2019 review says, and I quote, that the class size initiative has been in place for the last 15 years, um, with over $3.4 billion being allocated to school jurisdictions meaning school boards, to reduce class sizes. After a thorough review, Alberta's class size initiative does not appear to be effective and the class size grants targeted funding would be better put to use to support other priorities to improve student, student learning. So if you're interested in that issue, uh, we'll, we'll put that online for you to be able to, to access that. All right, Kara Wolf says, uh, do you have a budget for private vocational trainers in specialized fields such as AI? cybersecurity and quantum computing. Uh, so uh, ye yes, it, uh, I'll answer it. We, we have the, uh, set aside an additional, well, I, let me put it this way. We have flagged about, I think, two to $300 million out of the $1.5 billion uh, economic growth uh, contingency fund in today's budget for additional training programs. And much of that we expect will be focused on uh, the tech sector the, uh, Doug, I'm going to throw that to you because you know what's going on so well in that sector and the training needs there. Thanks, Premier. And this sector is just exciting to watch and to see what's happening in it. So we provide funding to Amy, which is based here in Edmonton. Uh, they provide uh, training tools. Uh, they work with graduate students at the University of Alberta and other institutions and in giving them the skill sets they need to be able to get hired in AI, machine learning. They do other research components that's there. We've also provide funding at the University of Calgary for quantum computing. Uh, there is also a whole bunch of new initiatives. One of them is at SAIT. Uh, there's a new uh, school for SAIT in downtown Calgary in the old Chamber of Commerce, uh, where they're taking, uh, they're collaborating with tech industry leaders, with business leaders for how do they shorten that turnaround time for people that want to get new skill sets. So we have such a well-educated workforce and many of them want to pivot. They want to try something new in their lives. They want to look for a new job opportunity. 
and SAIT is developing out a brand new program that's going to allow them to do that in the shortest possible time. So that's really exciting to see there. But we've also seen innovative companies. There's one called Alta ML, uh, an Alberta company, that's doing an immense amount of training right now. They, they develop their own cohorts. They work with companies. They know that these people are going to have jobs, and they, and they train them. Uh, there's a huge amount of advancement that's going on in AI and machine learning where companies know exactly what skill set that they need, and they're developing out their own training programs as well to help shorten that onboarding for their own business. And this goes back to the Premier's earlier comments about that job training program that we're going to be announcing with Jobs Now. That's going to help companies onboard people, train them, get them the skill sets they need. This is an area that's it's advancing so quickly that you know, we as government, we have to sometimes get out of the way of the private sector that's doing a really good job in this. And that's where that Jobs Now program can come in as well. Thanks, Doug. Next question to Jeff Brewster. Uh, and he says, quotes, this was posted on Rachel Notley's page. Can you please explain this? Quotes, Jason Kenney is raising taxes and he knows it. Thanks to his sneaky budget or sneaky bracket creep scheme in budget 2021, Albertans will be paying $100 million more in income tax this year, broken promise, unquote. So first of all, I would say that's pretty rich coming from the NDP <laughs> that in their four years in office raised the highest marginal income tax rate by 50%. And by the way, we got less money out of personal income taxes because a lot of high net worth individuals moved their income out of this province and uh, they, we, they ended up shrinking the tax base with this massive increase in tax rates. So we got less money out of it. Secondly, uh, they raised taxes on businesses, on job creators by 20% um, from 10 to 12 points. Uh, and thirdly, they imposed the largest tax increase in Alberta history, the one that they lied about in the, in the 2015 election, the carbon tax. We repealed the carbon tax effective uh, May of uh, 2019. Uh, we uh, rolled back their job killing tax on uh, businesses. Um, and Travis, would you like to comment further on that? Sure. Well, <clears throat> I'm happy to talk about uh, indexation. The reality is in budget 2021, there are no changes to indexation uh, for, for taxpayers in the province. Um, the, the fact is we are not indexing right now, but it is not resulting in tax increases. For, for example, if an indiv individual makes $50,000 in 2021, they will pay exactly the same amount of provincial tax as they did in 2020 if they made $50,000. Moreover, we have uh, the largest uh, basic personal exemption of any province in the country by far. Uh, our pre basic personal exemption is well over $3,000 more than the next nearest province. And so we, there's been no changes in budget 2021. If whatever uh, you paid in taxes last year based on your income, on that same income, you'll say the, pay the same amount of tax uh, in 2021. And, and lastly, uh, we continue to have a huge advantage in terms of personal exemption room in Alberta. All right, and I think uh, the consumer price index or inflation in Alberta right now is, is uh, like in the range of 1.5%. So um, we're not uh, exactly getting whacked by big inflation these days. All right, Tracy MacArthur says, $2 million for the ESG Secretariat. Isn't this the same as the war room? No, Tracy. Actually, the $2 million uh, for the Secretariat will come out of the $30 million that we initially uh, targeted for the Canadian Energy Centre. Uh, we ran on a commitment to fight back for Alberta's uh, largest job-creating industry, our uh, energy industry uh, against the highly uh, coordinated and foreign funded campaign to landlock Alberta uh, oil, which has cost us tens of thousands of jobs and tens of billions of dollars of revenue. We, we were elected not just to, uh, like the, ND, the, the NDP of course, agreed with uh, the green left. They are part of the green left. They fought against pipelines. Uh, they applauded Justin Trudeau when he killed Northern Gateway. They were mute when he killed Energy East. They opposed Keystone XL. They uh, brought in endless policies to damage the industry because that's who they are. That's fair enough. It's what they believe. It's free society. Our approach, uh, what we were elected to do, was uh, to fight back in a smart way. And uh, part of this, the ESG, means environmental and social, sorry, environmental, social, and governance metrics for investment. Increasingly, we're seeing that, that green left special interest lobby put pressure on banks, insurance companies, and investors who want to invest in the Alberta oil sands 
uh, with, a, with a campaign of lies about our environmental performance. The truth is that uh, an average barrel of Alberta heavy crude oil ha has a lower carbon uh, footprint than the average barrel of heavy crude around the world, like produced out of California or Nigeria. Uh, but these investors are, are often not told those facts. The, the Environmental Social Governance Secretariat will play a coordinating role at the center of government to work with our, the energy industry, which is 20% uh, of our economy, uh, to uh, uh, better inf coordinate Alberta's advocacy efforts on this critical issue. Next question goes to Piper King. How is the budget affecting those on AISH? Uh, Travis? Or, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, this budget does not change uh, ACE payments, uh, payments whatsoever. Uh, there have been no reduction. We continue uh, to support the vulnerable in this province uh, at the same level we did before. And in fact, Premier, during COVID, of course, we, uh, we increased our support for vulnerable Albertans, knowing that those, uh, you know, the vulnerable Albertans were, were severely affected in some cases by the pandemic and the resulting challenges. But H recipients will see no change as a result of budget 2021. Tra Travis, am I correct in remembering that um, the uh, that Alberta's AISH payments, that is, uh, uh, that's Al aid for, uh, that's Alberta income for the severely handicapped, it's a program that's about 30 years old, or, uh, isn't that uh, about 40% more generous than the next most generous province, which is Ontario? We're, we're about $400 higher per month than the, than the next nearest province. So. Uh, again, nothing will be changed in, in Budget 2021 for AISH recipients. All right. Dennis McNeil says, how much was the write down for Keystone or will that be in next year's budget? Back to you, Travis. All right, good. Well, we've, uh, we've not taken any write down or impairment at this point uh, with respect to Keystone. Um, the, the reality is we're pr pursuing every option with TC Energy around, uh, around the future of KXL. What we have done in Budget 2021, we've been very transparent with Albertans in terms of what our exposure is uh, with our KXL investment. Our exposure is just under $1.3 billion. And again, we're pr pursuing every opportunity. Our, our number one goal, of course, would be to see, find a way to see that project go forward. That project has incredible potential for wealth creation for Albertans as a whole. In fact, uh, the completion of, of Keystone XL for the province of Alberta would mean an additional $30 billion in government revenues, revenues to support social programs, health care, and education over a 20-year period. It would be a generational uh, investment. And, and number one priority is seeing that project go forward. In the event it cannot, then we will uh, pursue every opportunity to recoup our investment. Yeah, and, and uh, just to amplify that point, we are expect that we'll be in due course filing a a challenge to reclaim our investment from the U.S. administration, <clears throat> pardon me, under Chapter 11 of NAFTA, which has been carried forward uh, under the new uh, North American Trade Agreement. And basically it says if a government does something to prejudicially uh, damage an investment that's been made legally, um, then, then a claim can be made against that government. And so, I mean, that's a simplified summary of, a, of the legal principle in NAFTA. But we think we have a strong standing there. And we went into this investment knowing that. So in other words, we're going to fight like the Dickens to protect our investment from this unfair attack uh, on uh, our vital economic interests. Next question goes to Branko Korpich, who says, Europe just proposed a, quotes, COVID passport. Uh, what is your stance on this? Will Alberta follow this agenda? Uh, Branko, the answer is simply no. We will not follow that agenda. And no, we will not be issuing... COVID passports, we won't be issuing Alberta government uh, documents that, that to validate. In fact, my view is under our Privacy Act, it would be a violation of privacy to do that. There's only very narrow circumstances under which some uh, a, an organization, let's say an airline or an employer, uh, can ask for private health information. We don't think this would fall within those parameters. Tyler, on this point, why don't you give people a bit of a preview of your forthcoming amendments to the Public Health Act on issues like uh, vaccination. Thanks, Premier, and and thanks for also clarifying that uh, that uh, question. And our personal health information is just that; it's personal to us. Um, the ability for somebody to to make a, to have access to their records, to um, change their own records, if they want to share their own records, that's up to Albertans to decide. But we'll never compel anybody to disclose their personal information. As for the changes to the the Public Health Act, they'll be coming forward 
in um, in the spring session. But one of the the most uh, significant will be the uh, there right now in the Public Health Act is there a, um, an opportunity or an ability for government to compel a vaccination, and it's never been used before. It's been in that legislation for a very very long time. Um, I think uh, from our research, Premier, if you you may have to remind me, but I think it goes back to about uh, 1910 or something like that. Um, so it's always been in some form of the, the Public Health Act. Um, it's never been used in our history. Uh, Dr. Hinshaw gave evidence at a, um, an all-party committee of the legislature that was reviewing the Public Health Act, and she said herself that she sees uh, no need for government to compel vaccination. So we are going to be repealing that section of, of the act in particular, as well as a lot of other work that uh, was a result of the all-party committee when they did their work in reviewing the Public Health Act. Thanks, Tyler. All right, next question goes to Shelley Hankey, and she says, how much funding in this budget is earmarked for the deployment of rapid home testing and therapeutics to help manage the COVID-19 situation? So, um, well, over, I mean, I, I think the answer is there's a 1.5 billion in contingency, 1.25, yeah. sorry me, in contingency for COVID-related matters and uh, costs related to, for example, example, rapid testing would be within that. But do you want to uh, speak further to that, Tyler? Yeah, thanks, Premier. Happy to. Uh, as you said, that would come out of the 1.25 billion that is being budgeted for the the COVID pandemic response. Um, right now, when it comes specifically to those rapid tests, there are many that we have an opportunity to be able to provide to long-term care and other continuing care or congregate care settings like shelters and um, uh, correctional facilities. Um, and we're also working with employers throughout the province in deploying those rapid tests out to them so that they can screen their, um, their, their employees once a week to try and reduce uh, the amount of outbreaks we might have in workplaces or congregate living settings throughout the province. So uh, the specific number is, is going to be decided, determined by how many of those employers who step up and want to work with us. I'm very happy that we've, over the last couple of weeks, been able to have so many employers in the province, like Suncor and WestJet, wanting to work with us in having the, these rapid test screening opportunities for their, their workforce. And uh, so a big part of it is going to depend on how many of those employers step up. All right. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, Lindsay Harris has a question. Will you be providing funding to those who were laid off temporarily or permanently due to COVID-19 lockdowns? So, uh, Lindsay, the answer is that uh, Alberta has provided funding to businesses and employers, partly to help them keep people employed and, and keep their heads above water. We've also participated in the uh, commercial uh, rent subsidy program with the Government of Canada. Uh, we've provided um, nearly $400 million in payments uh, to frontline workers through the uh, essential worker benefit. Uh, but in terms of income support for people who have been unemployed through the crisis, uh, the federal government has uh, taken that on uh, initially through the CERB pro pro program, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. And Travis, where's that at now? Because they're still providing that uh, for different forms of cash support. That, that's right. Uh, and that's been rolled into uh, into the EI program, which has been enhanced as a result of COVID. And and Alberta employees like uh, Canadians, Canadian employees everywhere pay into the EI program. So the, the support should really be backstopped by the EI program. The federal government has a responsibility to, to provide that. All right, uh, Barry uh, or, and Cheryl Cooper say, why are we paying such a high rate uh, for electricity when it should be regulated? Well, it is very much uh, regulated, uh, Barry or Cheryl. Uh, it's, it, <laughs> there is very, very tight regulation of the electricity market. Um, and I think you're probably talking about the annoyingly high transmission costs. And my summary on that would be that about 10 years ago, decisions were made to significantly expand and modernize Alberta's electricity uh, transmission infrastructure, basically huge power lines uh, that cost billions and billions of dollars. And that was done 10 and 12 years ago on the expectation that our economy would continue to grow at, you know, five and six percent a year in the population along with it but of course instead we, over the past five years we've seen Alberta's economy shrink and stagnate and to be blunt our, our economy today is about 15 to 20 percent smaller than it was in 2014 so there's a smaller economic base small less people consuming electricity less industrial consumption of electricity and the costs of that expensive infrastructure 
are amortized and spread across the whole ratepayer base. And that's why we're paying, I think, outrageously high transmission rates right now. Our Minister for Natural Gas and Electricity, Dale Nally, is doing a deep dive into this right now and working with the electricity companies and the regulator to see if there's some better way of attenuating these costs uh, because I agree, they, they, they really are out, out, out of hand. And I think that, you know, we're doing everything we can. We're cutting taxes and re scrap the carbon tax, reducing taxes on businesses, reducing red tape, doing everything we can to bring investment. One of our attractive policies or, or advantages has been relatively low power prices. And we don't want, in manufacturers, for example, bypassing Alberta because of high transmission rates. Travis, do you want to add to that? Yeah, well, Premier, you've uh, you've really summed it up. We really need to find a way forward here, and, and uh, Minister Dale Nelly is doing that. It's going to be essential. As we look to position Alberta's economy uh, to be most competitive, uh, very competitive energy prices are an imperative. And so I appreciate you raising the question. We're on it. It's not lost on us, and uh, and we're looking at every possible solution. All right, we've got the next question is probably best to going to uh, Minister Schultz. It's Penny, Penny Van Kampen asks... Uh, please tell me why unlicensed child care providers are not eligible for the critical worker grants, but parents using those providers can receive this, their grant money. And that's a good question as well. It is one that we have gotten a couple times in the last two weeks since the announcement. It's really because when it comes to unlicensed care, we don't regulate or oversee it in any way nor do we have any way to confirm um, the incomes of, of these workers because this is a targeted support, um, really designed to support uh, frontline and essential service workers making uh, up to $25 an hour. And so by the nature of them being unlicensed and not paying some of those fees uh, and not having to adhere to any of our guidelines, um, they weren't able to qualify for that benefit. Thank you. Uh, so Trevor Weichel, or Weichel says, Hello, Premier. At Northwest Territories is doing a feasibility study for an offshore LNG terminal. Is Alberta in the loop on that project? Russia's making big money off of Arctic LNG right now. Well, um, I don't, I'm not sure that we are involved in that. It's first I've heard of it. It's great news. I should speak to Premier uh, Caroline, uh, my friend Caroline, the Premier up in uh, Yellowknife about that. I will tell you that uh, we are keen to support any possible uh, LNG infrastructure, West Coast, East Coast. I was talking to the Premier of Nova Scotia about the proposal for a major LNG project on the down in Nova Scotia. Uh, if we could ever see that uh, on the Arctic, we would uh, we would absolutely. If there's a private sector proponent willing to put some bucks behind it, uh, we would do everything we can to facilitate it. Um, I will add that unfortunately, the Trudeau government made a really, I think, terrible decision about uh, three years ago. They unilaterally brought in a ban on Arctic drilling without even consulting with the territories. And uh, now I know an LNG facility doesn't necessarily mean, is not necessarily tied to uh, Arctic production, but uh, this really was a devastating blow to the territories and part of the, the broader uh, attack on the industry that we've seen too often uh, from Ottawa. All right, Paul Chandler says, why did everyone's it's, uh, why did everyone's insurance rates almost double across Alberta, Travis? Uh, that's kind of in your bailiwick, eh? Well, well, sure it is, and um, well, well, firstly, um, insurance rates have gone up disproportionately uh, for for insurance consumers. But uh, uh, you know, we have automobile insurance, and we also have property insurance. On the property insurance side, insurers call Alberta right now. In fact, all of Canada, uh, a hard market where losses have been high. Indemnity payouts have been high, and premiums have been reflecting that. So in terms of property insurance, the Alberta government really doesn't uh, play a, a role at that point. We, we have to ensure, and, and we have ensured, that we have a, uh, a business environment that encourages um, competition, a business environment where there is no prohibition to entry for insurance companies, and, and so there's uh, been great competition. Again, unfortunately, with our hard insurance market, it, it has resulted in increased insurance costs for property owners. Now, with respect to automobile insurance, uh, we do play a, a more active role there. And automobile insurance uh, premiums have been rising, and that's why we brought in uh, an insurance bill uh, last fall, during our last session. And that insurance bill provided uh, clarity around the definition of a, of a minor injury. That clarity uh, is, a, and, a, and a number of other measures in that bill uh, and regulatory changes is expected to bring 
uh, down in automobile insurance premiums uh, to the tune of about $120 per year from where they would otherwise be. So uh, we are taking steps, taking action to bring down the high cost of insurance premiums on automobile insurance uh, with respect to property insurance. Uh, that remains a challenge. Uh, losses in Alberta have been higher uh, than some other regions and, uh, and insurers are, are uh, pushing premiums up accordingly. Uh, our, our hope is that uh, we can kind of get past um, these natural disasters that we've been seeing in, in the province over the last uh, five or eight or ten years and, and then to start to see a, a softening, a reduction of insurance premiums for property. Thanks, Travis. Uh, okay, next question to Barney Betty says, how many positions in AHS and government are you going to get rid of? AHS could easily get rid of 10,000 ma management <laughs> positions. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll tell you why I'm laughing in a second. And it would improve the processes. Well, Barney, uh, there's no doubt that they can operate more efficiently. I'm going to refer this to, to Tyler, but um, I think they only have about 1,000 uh, senior management positions. So there wouldn't be much left if we eliminated 10,000. But, but, uh, but there will be some reductions as part of our... Um, uh, modernization of, of AHS. Over to you, Tyler. Thanks, Premier, and thanks, Barney. And uh, Premier, you're right. Uh, about 110,000 employees in AHS, and 91% and of them are unionized. The um, Out of the rest, or out of all of AHS's 110,000 employees, about 3% of them, uh, just a little under 3%. So it's 3,200 positions that are management positions. Um, out of those, 68 are senior leaders, and 14 are in the executive team. Um, so it's it's much less. It's about a third of what uh, you're even thinking of eliminating in management positions, uh, Barney. Uh, but you, you're, and as Premier said, and he highlighted that there is absolutely an opportunity to work with AHS to make them more efficient, make them a high performer. And that was the point uh, of the review that we did in 2019 of the, uh, the performance review of AHS. And once we receive that report, we're, so far we are proceeding with AHS in, um, in implementing a portion, um, considering the pandemic we're in the middle of right now, a balanced portion of those uh, recommendations that we can start now. Some of them are to, to contract out, for example, laundry, where we already have laundry contracted out for about 60-something percent of the province. All of Calgary, all of Edmonton already contracted out. But there's, a, there's an opportunity to contract out the remainder of, of laundry in, in the, the province. Uh, for our community labs as well, we already have Dino Life providing our community labs, or at least 70% of the community labs north of Red Deer. There's an opportunity to have community labs contracted out uh, for, for um, south, uh, Red Deer and South. And so those types of opportunities we have to, to make AHS more efficient, there are going to be opportunities where those jobs might be in the private sector providing the, those services to AHS. Um, and AHS uh, might itself be reduced in, in those positions, but the economy as a whole, especially when it comes to labs, would, would still have those jobs in the economy. Thanks, Barney. All right. Uh, next question goes to Jason Brandle. He says... Thank too much for that one. Uh, sorry. Uh, whatever happened to shut the taps off until we get a fair deal? So I think, Jason, you're referring to our commitment to uh, bring into effect Le legislation was passed in 2018-19 uh, that would allow Alberta to stop or impede sending uh, commodities like energy, oil and gas, uh, to other provinces. Um, I've got to be a little bit careful about how I answer this right now because it's subject to a lawsuit that BC filed against us. But the bottom line is this. We kept our commitment. We brought that legislation into effect as our very first act as a government. We went from the swearing-in ceremony uh, up to the cabinet room and brought that law into force. And uh, I then called uh, Premier John Horgan and we, we let them know. And the point about this was not to, not to cut off our nose despite our face and, 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 st and just stop selling energy to the rest of Canada because that would cost us tens of billions of dollars. The point was to use it as leverage. And all I can say is this, the BC government has told us and they have said publicly, uh, that, that since then they have downed tools in their, uh, they have no more tools in the toolbox to fight or impede uh, the Trans Mountain expansion. And in fact, uh, I was just speaking to Ian Anderson, the president of the uh, Trans Mountain project yesterday. Uh, he's done amazing work for the past decade on this project. And he advised me that construction is on schedule 
and that the BC government is continuing to issue all necessary permits on time. So um, read that as you will, but all I can say is we said we were going to use it as leverage to, to get the BC government to cooperate. They lost. at the, By the way, we challenged them. Alberta challenged their uh, uh, regulatory efforts to uh, impede the construction of Trans Mountain expansion. They lost that at the Supreme Court of Canada. And uh, all I can say is uh, we are getting that pipeline built uh, and uh, there is no longer any um, opposition from the BC government. In fact, it hardly even came up as an election issue uh, in BC last fall. All right, Ian uh, Meaden says, by 23-24, over $3 billion of Government of Alberta revenue will go to service our debt. This will only continue to climb as deficits continue or interest rates rise. Uh, these are always socioeconomic conditions that arise, or sorry, there are always conditions that arise, and we don't know uh, what will come next. True enough, Ian. Therefore, my question is, I'm in my 40s, should I just give up on my dream of seeing the Alberta government balance its books and get to a point where we are debt-free again? We can't afford to continue this perpetual debt cycle. Ian, first of all, thank you. It's nice to hear from a fiscal conservative uh, every now and then. Uh, Travis, over to you. Sure. Sure, Ian, thanks for that question. And my, my short answer is don't give up, Ian. Uh, balancing the budget remains critically important to this government, and I believe that it's important to all Albertans. Uh, in 2019, uh, we presented a four-year fiscal plan that would bring this province to balance. It was a credible plan, and we were making good progress on that plan when COVID hit. Unfortunately, uh, COVID, the uh, economic uh, collapse, economic collapse uh, globally, the collapse in energy prices have, you know, hit Alberta government revenues very hard. And even as we see the, the economy uh, restart, which is encouraging, it has changed the trajectory of our, of our government revenues. So we won't be able to balance in this first term. But balancing remains important. And that's why we have now uh, identified three fiscal anchors that will, uh, will inform our decisions until we get to a point of, of presenting a balanced budget again. Number one, the first fiscal anchor is to keep our net debt to GDP ratio uh, below 30%. That's a critical ratio uh, because it, it really uh, indicates uh, a province's balance sheet strength and also the ability to raise government revenues based on the size of the economy. Uh, the uh, interprovincial average pre-COVID for net debt to GDP was 30%. And I, all the other provinces are going to go much, much higher as a result of COVID. Ours is going to go higher from what it otherwise was. We started the year out this year with about a 10% or 11% net debt to GDP ratio. Ours is going to go up over the course of this fiscal plan. It's going to go up to about 26% based on our plan. But we're going to keep it below 30%, which will ensure that we have a relatively strong balance sheet as we emerge, and that will be critical to fiscal recovery. Second, our second fiscal anchor, and bear with me here, our second fiscal anchor is to ensure that we're delivering government services most cost efficiently. And we're gonna measure that uh, relative to the per capita cost of our comparator provinces in, in delivering government services. The McKinnon panel pointed out that, uh, that Alberta was about $10 billion high prior to 2019. And their recommendation was to, uh, over time, align our costs on a per capita basis with that of other provinces. Our budget 2021 accomplishes that goal in 2022, 23, and 23, 24. That's the first step to bring our expenditures under control. We are going to continue to ensure we keep our debt below the 30% net debt to GDP ratio. And, uh, and, and then, and once we're past COVID, once we've brought our expenditures down in line, at that point in time, uh, we will appoint a revenue panel to better understand uh, the efficiency and appropriateness of our revenue structure in this province. But I agree uh, with, with your inference in the question, and that, that is this. We cannot download excessive spending to the next generation. Balancing the budget remains critically important to this government. And when we get, see our way clear of this pandemic, when we have additional economic clarity, we will provide a path and timeline to a balanced budget. Uh, Ian, you probably could tell you just hit Travis's uh, hot button there. Um, he is very passionate and focused on this, and rightfully so. It, this, we were on track to balance in this term of government, per our election commitment, 
until we got hit by the triple black swan, I call it, uh, the pandemic, the global economic collapse, and the energy price collapse. You know, at the, uh, at the height of this, about 11 months ago, our revenues were down, well, in a good year, Alberta used to bring in 10 billion in oil and gas revenues. In the last few years, it was, we were averaging about 5 billion. Uh, through much of this year, we were looking at less than 1 billion. We're talking about a 90% reduction in that source of revenue through much of this past year. So that's just how uh, catastrophic the, uh, the pandemic has been on this province. Um, and, and, and before I go to the next question, I uh, wanted to go back to the, the gentleman who asked me about uh, Northwest Territories LNG. So I've done some quick research here. I like to get things done quickly. And I've already spoken by text with our Minister of Natural Gas, Dale Nelly. And he is aware of the, t there are actually two proposals up in the NWT, uh, one at Inuvik, one near uh, Tuktoyaktuk. And um, he says that uh, uh, he's working with the proponents. And I have also texted uh, Premier Carolyn Cochran uh, to see if I, if I can collaborate with her on that. All right, so next question goes to Rocky View, Alberta Teachers Association, Local 35. Uh, please let us know how Budget 2021 will account for a projected increase of 20,000 K-12 students in 2021-22 if it stays flat at 2020 spending. I, I think that's best to you, Travis. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer that question. And in 2020, Minister LaGrange brought in a new education funding formula. It was a, it was a very good change to the funding formula. It will ensure that school boards uh, are, are better funded relative to cha uh, enrollment changes. And it, they can also, it will also provide additional predictability for school boards uh, for the upcoming year. And so Minister LaGrange is confident that our budget allocation in, in budget 2021 will in fact provide adequate funding for uh, school uh, growth and enrollment growth for 21-22. Moreover, in the current year, based on our, our uh, new funding formula, uh, given the fact that student enrollment is down this year, with more students staying home, perhaps being homeschooled, uh, or finding other uh, ways to, uh, to gain their education this year, with, uh, given the pandemic, uh, given the funding formula, we would uh, normally have been holding back or not advancing uh, a, an, an additional $130 million to school boards. And again, that was simply based on uh, student enrollment. We are not going to hold that back. We are going to fully fund school boards with that $130 million. And that will ensure that they're able to deliver education at a time when they're challenged. Uh, there's higher sub costs because, because of COVID, teachers having to be out and self-isolate. But it will also ensure that school boards uh, reserves are largely kept intact and they're able to respond uh, to uh, student enrollment uh, in the upcoming year. All right, uh, next question goes to Pam Sholak. And uh, Pam asks, Premier and Minister, thank you for being here. Can you provide some more information on the Jobs Now initiative that was allocated $136 million in the budget? Thank you. Actually, I, I, I have to correct myself because earlier in talking about it, I didn't realize it was a uh, specified line item in the budget. I thought it was within the, the uh, contingency for uh, jobs and growth. But, uh, Doug, do you want to take that one on? Yeah, and thank you so much for that question. Like, this is actually a really exciting opportunity. And I mentioned earlier on about... Yeah, how do we reduce that cost for businesses to hire new employees? Uh, and this is really built into that strategy of jobs now. We want to make sure that it's employer driven. So it's not going to be government getting in the way of this, saying, dictating who's going to get what. Uh, the businesses are going to be directing this. It's going to be, there's going to be more details to come here in the next little while. But in talking in particular to some of these fast growing emerging companies that are in the tech space in particular, you know, they want to hire Albertans. You know, they could go to a, a, a different market. They could go and hire people in Toronto or San Francisco or other places, but they want to hire Albertans and they want to train them. And this type of a program is going to allow them to reduce the cost to train, allow them to hire Albertans and get them working again. Same thing applies. Perfect. Another perfect example is in the geothermal space. We had a, a big investment recently in, a, in an Alberta-based company that's doing a big geothermal project. This type of jobs now program would allow them to hire people out in the oil patch that are experienced in drilling and to get them into a new field as well. So it's really designed for that and companies that want to hire Albertans that might need a little bit of extra training to onboard them onto their company. Uh, it just it reduces barriers and just makes it a, you know, a win-win both for the employer uh, and for Albertans that are looking for work. And uh, actually, this is based partly on something called the Canada Job Grant, which I actually developed when I was in the federal government as Minister of Employment and Social Development. 
and uh, Doug has summarized the, the, the principles of it pretty well. Uh, we're still ironing out the details with the federal government because we would be using a portion of the funds that we get through something called the labor market agreements. But bottom line is it, it's, it will be a demand-driven, employer-led cost-share program. Uh, we want it to be tailored and flexible. Um, and and the, bottom, the, the reality is this. We recognize there is, we, Travis and I have been talking about this, we've got pretty good projections out there about an overall Alberta economic recovery better than what we put in the budget, to be honest with you, because of energy prices being, being high right now. But where we are most concerned is, is to see that growth, not just at some abstract level, but we want it to, to turn into jobs, and especially for the people who have been unemployed or have on and off employment for the past four or five years. And so that's why we'll be putting in more money, more money than Alberta ever has, into supporting this kind of uh, training initiative. Uh, all right, Beryl or Cheryl, Barry or Cheryl Cooper, I think I, we got a question from them before, if I'm not mistaken. They ask, when, we're, when are we voting on the referendum on equalization payments? Uh, in October of this year, uh, as we committed in our election platform, the vote on equalization will be on the same day as the municipal election. Um, a lot more efficient and easy for people to have uh, one or multiple ballots rather than having a separate voting day. And the reason we, we scheduled it for this fall as well was to have some leverage over the federal government. If we would have done that early in our term and, and it was done and dusted, we, we wouldn't really have that as a point of leverage on our fight for fairness, um, our fight for, Travis talked today about fiscal fairness. We're being shortchanged about $4 billion uh, in something called the Fiscal Stabilization Program. It just part that add an insult to injury to Alberta having to contribute net about $20 billion to the rest of the country, even during challenging times. All right, Carol Scobie says, how are you going to bring in some manufacturing to do with our resources? That's a great question for uh, Doug Schweitzer. Thanks, Premier. And this is one of the sector strategies that we're, we're building out. Out. Uh, and Minister Taves uh, has highlighted in our budget uh, $500 million that we've earmarked for you know, part of our recovery efforts here in Alberta. So we're developing out sector strategies from aviation, logistics, manufacturing. But I'm really uh, bullish on the opportunities here in from a whole host of different sectors. Uh, Minister Taves earlier on uh, highlighted agricultural manufacturing and other pieces that go along with that industry. Uh, you know what? We also had big drivers uh, for manufacturing in Alberta that was tailored for the oil sands. And we've seen companies already in the capital region that used to be focused on servicing those oil sands that are now building things like elevators. That we're very good at welding. We're good at wiring. We're good at switches. All these things that can be pivoted to other services that are out there. And we're also blessed with geography. Uh, Alberta's very well positioned from the Edmonton airport, from flights that coming in overseas, to Calgary from a logistical perspective, rail lines that we have in our province as well. This is really important for manufacturing because you have to be able to get those goods to market. So we're taking a look at that. We're fleshing out the strategy to make sure we can capitalize on this. It also builds on the work that Shane Getson is doing. So we're doing a study right now on rail capacity, rail to Alaska potentially, taking a look at northern corridors as well for economic development. All of that plays into logistics, which plays into manufacturing, which builds on that part of our diversification strategy. Thanks, Doug. All right, to Clark Griswold says, asks, uh, can you ensure Alberta doesn't get an HST or a carbon tax? So on the, uh, the HST, I think you mean harmonized sales tax. So we've been absolutely clear about that, Clark, that uh, we are not bringing in a sales tax that right now would be the worst time to do. We've been pressured by a big business group recently to do that. And my response was now would be the worst time to bring in additional taxes for government to squeeze more out of taxpayers when they're already hard hit by the recession, the pandemic and everything. Um, instead, we've got to demonstrate to taxpayers that we can operate more efficiently. That's a part of the focus of today's budget. Secondly, uh, no provincial sales tax or harmonized sales tax can legally be brought into Alberta without the consent of Albertans uh, through a referendum as a result of the Taxpayer Protection Act passed by the Klein government in 1995. I actually had a role in writing that. So if at some point in the future Albertans decide they want to change the revenue mix and bring in a, a consumption tax, an HST, it, it's in their hands, but through a referendum. And on a carbon tax, as you know, we repealed the NDP carbon tax uh, as our very first uh, law 
uh, as a government back in the summer of 2019. And uh, then Trudeau imposed on us his federal carbon tax in uh, New Year's of 2020. Uh, and then we immediately filed our constitutional challenge against that. We won that challenge at the Alberta Appeal Court on a four to one vote where they determined that the federal carbon tax was, co quotes, a constitutional Trojan horse. Um, that uh, decision has since been appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada, and we are expecting a decision in the next few weeks. We're going to have to take a look at what our options are after that. We'll certainly consult with Albertans to get their advice um, on the best way forward, uh, should we not be successful, but hopefully we will be. Okay, Wade Hutchinson says, where's the diversification in the budget? Well, uh, it's all over the place. Um, I'll, I'll start with Travis and then go to Doug. Sure, Premier, uh, you answered that well. It's it's woven throughout Budget 2021. And I'll let uh, Minister uh, Schweitzer talk about the specific sector strategies, which, which really key in on diversification. But I'll talk about what we're doing broadly to create a very competitive business environment. We brought our business tax rate from uh, down from 12 to 8%. We're, we're modernizing our uh, regulatory environment in this province. In fact, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business has very recently given Alberta an A grade on regulatory modernization. And that's pretty significant considering we inherited an F grade from the previous government. And so broadly, we are looking to ensure that we are providing uh, investment proponents, Albertans and businesses with the most competitive business environment possible. And that encourages diversification. That ensures that wherever we have a... Uh, a real natural competitive advantage, businesses can come in, invest, and succeed. Now we're doing more than that. We're also targeting specific sectors where we believe we can be competitive, and we're positioning those sectors for growth, and that will result in diversification. But I'll, I'll turn it over to Minister well, Schweitzer. Actually, before we go to Doug, I'd like to be specific, and people deserve to know where the answers, the detailed answers are. But if you look at the budget that Travis table today, and it's all online, if you go to page eight, you'll see Alberta's response and economic recovery. This is at the very beginning, like this is the very first section of the budget. And then it goes specifically into Alberta's recovery plan on pages 9, 10, 11, and 12. And that is a good high-level summary of, of the huge investments that this government is making to further diversify Alberta's economy. So some of the, this, this is a great summary right at the beginning of the budget. And for more, over to you, Doug. Thank you, Premier. And uh, yeah, just building on what Minister Taves uh, had mentioned there, yeah, there's the three key things. We're making sure we have the lowest taxes possible. So that's the job creation tax cut. Efficient government, so getting our spending in the line with the other big provinces. The red tape reduction, Minister uh, Taves as well, had mentioned as well. That's critical. The other piece of it's talent, making sure we have the right talent, the right training opportunities for Albertans as well. So they have the skill sets for the jobs now and also for the jobs of tomorrow. So that's kind of the three pillars that go into the strategy. That's the macro things that give Alberta that advantage that we know we have here in our province, and that entrepreneurial spirit that allows people to be successful. And then drilling down into different sectors. I mean, take a look at our foundations that we have. We've got an amazing energy industry, amazing agricultural sector, amazing forestry sector. All of those things are pillars for us to build on. And we never want to ignore those three key elements of our economy. They got us here. You, you, they, they're going to continue to be here for us. They're going to continue to employ thousands of Albertans and create wealth for the future. That's critical for us. I'll maybe highlight a couple other elements of our strategy that we haven't talked about yet tonight. One of them will be film and television. Uh, since I took over this ministry, we've been and laser focused on working with the major studios. Like people used to think of film and television as just the arts. This is billion dollar business. Uh, and we've got now at least five television series that are here in Alberta that are significant television series. We're looking at attracting a couple more that we're in final discussions with right now. And the film and television space is gonna have their best year in over 20 years in Alberta. And we've been strategic in our approach, making sure we have that foundational year over year building blocks. We're looking at attracting further television studios here for, for the development as well to build out that sector. Another key part of our diversification strategy, tourism. I mean, Alberta has immense resources of the beautiful Rockies that we have. We've got events like Stampede. You've got world-class places at Drumheller around dinosaur bones. I mean, my daughters love going to see the dinosaur bones there. But one thing that we have that we haven't fully fleshed out to the full capacity is actually indigenous tourism. Uh, you go to places like Mexico, Indigenous tourism is at the forefront of what they're marketing and what they're selling. We can do, we're just scratching the surface in Indigenous 
business tourism opportunities here in Alberta. People, from, we've done some market tests on this. People from Europe, when they come to Alberta, they want to experience Indigenous tourism. So we want to partner with Indigenous communities. You'll see in our budget, we increased the budget for Travel Alberta by over $20 million. We want to partner with them to build out that strategy for success long term. The tourism industry has also been hard hit during this pandemic, obviously, with reduced travel. We've been there with tourism. We're going to continue to be there to support small businesses. We've got the enhanced COVID-19 business benefit as well, providing an additional $10,000 to those businesses that have been hurt the most in this pandemic. That's another support that we've got. It's going to help keep that backbone there for long-term growth. I mean, we can get into a whole host of other things that we're working on. Uh, the natural gas strategy, I'd encourage you to take a look at it. You've got hydrogen opportunities. You've got, we've also got a mines and mineral strategy around lithium and developing out the resources for the future for electric vehicles and other things that are developing around the world. There's a huge demand for these types of products. We have them here in Alberta. And the one thing I've, I just kind of note is that we've had it really good here in Alberta for a few decades going back. And we didn't even scratch the surface on some of these opportunities. And this recovery plan with the premier's leadership and working with all of our colleagues and Minister Taves, this is the largest diversification effort in my entire lifetime. And we're not going to ignore the foundation that got us here, but we're starting to see those green shoots now of economic diversification. The technology sector, you know, that's starting to tip. It's starting to become a real play where the velocity of investment in venture capital is breaking records every single year. 2019 was a record year. 2020 destroyed that year from, a, from an investment perspective. In 2021, we're already off to a faster start than the previous year. So we're really starting to see those moment, that momentum grow for diversification in Alberta. Uh, one of the reasons Doug's so excited is because he and I know about some forthcoming announcements um, in the next weeks and months, which are, I, I think, are really going to pump up Albertans. I just heard about another one, Doug, today that you probably don't know about. But, uh, but a major company looking at a multi-billion dollar investment in a, a critical industry for diversification, leveraging off of our natural resources. Uh, uh, next week, uh, we've got a big announcement coming uh, with respect to new information technology investment and a lot of other exciting stuff. Next question goes to Ann Erker, who says, anything in the budget for seniors? Well, yes, Ann, uh, if, you, if you want to go and, and see yourself online uh, to the Alberta budget, Pages 108 to 111 uh, outlines the spending plan for the Department of Seniors and Housing. And uh, the main thing we're doing here is, despite our huge $18 billion deficit, we are maintaining the country's most generous benefits in Canada uh, uh, for seniors amongst provincial governments. And uh, so we're maintaining that. In fact, it's growing. The Alberta Seniors Benefit Last year was four hundred and five billion dollar million. Whoops, four hundred and five million, and it's going up to next year's. Tra Travis is taking it up to four hundred and seventy six, four hundred and seventy nine million. So uh, that refl reflects the growing number of retirees. Uh, all right, Maria Dus Dusevich says, uh, "Do you believe it was a wise decision to sink over one point five billion into Keystone XL before seeing the outcome of the American election?" Do you take any responsibility for this loss? Uh, Maria, uh, first of all, it's not over 1.5 billion. Uh, we haven't worked out the final figure, but it'll be a fair bit less than that uh, should we take an impairment on it. Um, and I think it was the right decision, absolutely. We went into it eyes wide open. Our government was elected on a mandate to pursue jobs, grow the economy, and get pipelines built. Uh, TC Energy had spent $6 billion and a decade on that critical project. Um, and they finally got a per permit from the last president, got local legal permits, and they were ready to roll. But the private sector wasn't going to step forward because of the legal and political harassment from the green left organizations trying to landlock Alberta energy. As a government, we were not going to surrender to those organizations, to those U.S. billionaires and foundations funding the anti-Alberta energy campaign. We were elected to stand up to them. And the whole strategy here was to create facts on the ground. Uh, when, when we made the decision to partner with TC Energy uh, and made the final decision in March of last year, then candidate Joe Biden had not taken a position. Uh, some of the uh, more left-wing members of his party, Senator Sanders, had signed commitments to veto Keystone XL retroactively, but Senator Biden had not done so. And we assumed that, that I mean, he had the support of 
uh, the Building Trades Union, the Steel Workers Union, the Teamsters, the Truckers Union, Lyuna, Major Construction Union, all of whom strongly support the project, and they all indicated to us that their belief that he would be with the union uh, members and work American workers, jobs in the economy on this issue. So yes, we made a we took a risk knowingly, but we, we're not going to get pipelines built in this country without taking some risks. And uh, we wanted to demonstrate that we were prepared to, to, to fight back, to get these things built. And look at the, at the upside of this was the following. $30 billion of incremental revenue for the government of Alberta over the next 20 years had that project gone forward. Uh, with our decision to do so, we did create jobs, thousands of high paying unionized construction jobs uh, in Alberta uh, and Saskatchewan this summer when we needed those jobs most during the COVID recession. And we've also uh, got assets there. We'll be able to do some asset sales if we need to. But finally, we think that we can recover a, a substantial portion or all of this uh, potential loss uh, by uh, suing the U.S. government under, uh, for having violated its very clear obligations under the uh, NAFTA trade agreement, Chapter 11 on investor protection. So, you know, looking at all of that, uh, our view was, and, and, and the other thing is this, if we were to sur have surrendered and not, not seen an inch of pipe put in the ground on that project after a decade and a $6 billion investment by a great Alberta company, all of the pressure focused on Keystone XL simply would have gone to Enbridge's Line 3 replacement project and Line 5. So this, we have to look at the fight for Alberta's economic future, especially in the energy sector, uh, in a strategic, in a big picture strategic sense. That's what the other side has been doing ever since the Rockefeller Foundation gathered two dozen left uh, groups from the le uh, green left in 2008 to formulate the tar sands campaign. They've been very strategic. They've been bold. They've take, taken risks. And our government was elected to do the same in fighting for, for our economic future and fighting for jobs. Okay, we're just going to take a couple more questions because I think we're clicking close to uh, 35 questions. Brad Toon says, thank you for your continued support of education. When will we hear more about the new and modernized schools announced? Uh, uh, Travis? Sure, good. Happy to take that one, Premier. Uh, there are 14 uh, new school projects in, in our capital plan in Budget 2021. I would say stay tuned for the announcements. I don't have the specific timing of, uh, of, of when, you know, there's going to be a, a ribbon cutting and, uh, and celebration on those schools. But stay tuned. Uh, we've identified in our capital plan which schools those are across the province. And uh, education capital funding remains a very high priority for this government. Minister LaGrange has done an excellent job of prioritizing where the great need is for either school modernizations or new school builds. So stay tuned. Okay, we got any one more question here, perhaps? I'm just uh, trying to find one. Uh, Travis, how about those nice country boots? You bought those, those sorry, those cowboy boots. You bought them at uh, the boot factory in Calgary last I, I week? Did, I did, uh, uh, at the Alberta Boot uh, Company, and, and uh, they're manufactured right here in the province, Premier. I've never bought a pair of uh, uh, boots manufactured in the province. It was a pleasure and privilege to go down there and, and buy them. Great staff. Great store, third, and great heritage. Absolutely, third generation Alberta family business. Did they take you back into their little factory where they produce a lot of the? You know, they they couldn't because of COVID oh. rules. But um, boy, if we can get Stampede going this summer, I'm going right back there <laughs> to take a tour. Absolutely. Okay, I got a last question here. Uh, Betty Leishner says thoughts on universal basic income. Travis, apparently, sure. apparently this has caused a big fuss over in the NDP where the socialists are just tearing each other apart because some of them want, of course, to spray more money on people and some people don't agree with that. So what's your well, take on it, Travis? Well, well, well here's, here's my take on it. Um, it, is, it is so valuable and important for Albertans uh, to be able to um, earn a living, uh, have a job. With a job comes great purpose. Uh, with a job uh, comes great social connection. Uh, with, with a job the, and the ability to provide for, for oneself and one's family, uh, there's great pride in that. And so uh, I am not in favor of, of a, a basic income. What I'm in favor of is positioning the Alberta economy for growth and job creation. So Albertans can uh, pursue their dreams and aspirations 
pursue their careers, provide them uh, for themselves and their families. That's my vision of Alberta. Well, that was beautifully put and 100% agreed. Uh, all right, last question we're going to do. Uh, Seth Bork uh, is how do we help our younger and future generations become financially literate? That is a great question. Seth, you are going to be very pleased with the draft new K-6 K social studies curriculum that uh, Minister LaGrange's uh, expert panel is finalizing right now. Um, and it's about to go out for consultations in the next couple of weeks, I think. Um, and there's a very strong emphasis on uh, financial literacy. That is something we committed to. Um, obviously, literacy itself, the ability to read, uh, critically important, as is numeracy. Uh, so uh, by improving our, our basic math skills uh, coming out of our, our uh, primary school system. But financial literacy will be a significant uh, point of emphasis as well in the revised curriculum. All right, folks, we've been at this for about an hour and a half. We've taken 38 questions. That's a pretty good number. I think, Travis, I don't know about you, I think these were better questions than what we get in question period. They were great questions, Freeman. <laughs> really great. Thank you to those of you in the other room, uh, to um, uh, Doug Schweitzer, Rebecca Schultz, and Tyler Shandro. Appreciate uh, you joining us here tonight. I, and by the way, this was billed as a, a fireside chat. And normally, I think they call these things fireside chats, and there's no fire. We actually got one over here, and it's burning good, clean Alberta natural there gas. And those gas prices, we hope they stay up where they are right now. That's right. But uh, thank, thank you. Great work on the budget, Travis, and all of my, all the other ministers. Thank you for your hard work. Uh, thank you, folks, for tuning in and for your great questions. Look forward to being back in touch uh, soon.